Nick, in your career, you have spent a great deal of time with both animals and humans and understanding their psychological constructs. How can you help me understand this spectrum? Some would claim that human beings are a step function in, in different than the, the, the trajectory of the animal world. Others would say that it's a fairly uh, straightforward continuum. Certainly human culture has, has had a great deal of, of accumulated knowledge. How do you compare human beings with the animal world mentally? Well, I've learned so much from animals about humans then of, that of course you know i have must must say that it's the continuities which have really impressed me uh when i was working with mountain gorillas for example in rwanda it was sitting amongst these extraordinary creatures observing their social interactions which set me on the path to wondering about the evolution of human social mm. intelligence mm. so the Machiavellian intelligence hypothesis, the idea that our brains have evolved to solve social problems, arose directly out of observations made on animals. What did you see at that time? I looked at those extraordinary creatures with their huge heads and huge brains and wondered what they were doing with their brains <laughs> because the life of gorillas in the forest is incredibly simple. Food is easy to gather and abundant. There are no predators. Life's really pretty mm. easy, easy going. So why do these creatures have this extraordinary intelligence that we know they have from studies in the lab? Well, sitting amongst them and watching their interactions, I suddenly saw them with new eyes. I realized that while the forest as such didn't present them with any great problems, their own community presented them with an amazing range of difficult, puzzling, uh, uh, tricky issues they had to work out. Um, issues to do with hierarchy, dominance, sex, child rearing, everything else, which makes up the social life of a gorilla group. Now, humans, of course, are even more complex in their social life. And so I went from there from, from arguing that gorillas have probably evolved their large brains largely to solve the problems of living in a gorilla family, in a gorilla group. Humans' brains, which are three times the size of gorillas, have evolved to solve the problems of living in human society, which is more than three times mm -hmm. as complex as that of, of a gorilla troop. So um, continuity certainly exists. But then I think we're increasingly coming to realize that there are big discontinuities too. The step function you referred to that might that suddenly means that humans left behind their animal ancestors is a reality. It was created by a series of remarkable innovations in the human line. Probably on, in terms of cognitive functioning, language was the most important step. Language released new forms of thinking, new forms of, of social interaction, new ways of interacting with the world in humans, which fed on itself and basically gave us a runaway new form well, of life. It created a cumulative culture yes. that one could add to the yes, other. Yes, of course. And But equally, I, I think that human consciousness is in its own league as well. I think humans have a more refined form of consciousness, deeper consciousness. I think our consciousness is even more fascinating and mysterious than you would discover if you could go into the mind of a chimpanzee or an ape. And... That's because in humans, consciousness has become the basis of our sense of ourselves as spiritual beings, individuals imbued with something very much like the old-fashioned notion of a Christian soul. And that is an outcome of natural selection, but it's one which has suddenly made us take off in a new direction. And it required changes in the very nature of consciousness. I actually think that what it's like to be a human, to use that phrase which is often used in relation to consciousness, what it's like to be a human is something completely unique. I mean that even at the sensory level. I think our experience of colors and sounds and, and tastes and so on has dimensions to it which may be hinted at in the consciousness of our animal ancestors, but which probably don't reach the heights which we experience. Some have said that the difference between human consciousness and animal consciousness is that humans have self-consciousness, awareness of themselves being conscious, where animals do not. Oh. Is that too facile? No, I think that's certainly true as well. There's every reason to believe that 
one of the major developments in humans becoming what I've called natural psychologists, having this astonishing capacity to read the minds of other creatures, that that involved a new form of reflective consciousness. So far as we can tell, chimpanzees, apes in general, are really not very good at that. They do have insight into the minds of the, of the conspecifics they live among, but they don't attribute states of mind in the way we do. They don't engage in what's sometimes called belief desire psychology, in which we understand how humans operate by attributing to them states of belief, desires, intentions, and so on. We do that because we discover in our own case that that's the kind of creatures we are. We observe our own inner, the inner workings of our mind and can then project it onto other creatures. We can simulate their minds. If it's occurring at all in gorillas or in chimps, it's at a very much lower level and it doesn't run smoothly in the way it does for us. Little human beings, infants leave behind chimpanzees at the age of about one and a half years old when they develop a self-concept of a kind which a chimpanzee never aspires to and when they begin to attribute that sense of self to the other creatures around them.